ever get that feeling? Yeah, everyone's talking about Bitcoin, but uh, what it really is feels kind of fuzzy. Oh, absolutely. You're definitely not alone there. Yeah, even people who own some, they sometimes admit they don't fully grasp the, uh, the, the mechanics underneath. That's right. It's huge. It's everywhere in finance, tech talk. But getting a solid handle on it still feels tricky for many. Well, that's exactly what we're going to try and fix today. Welcome to the Deep Dive. We take these big, complex topics and, well, we try to make them clear, give you the insights you need. Make them make sense. Exactly. Today, it's all about Bitcoin. Yeah. We want to cut through the noise, yeah. you know, get past the hype, and really understand its core, what it is, how it actually works. And we've got a great source to guide us. We're looking at an explanation from the Coin Bureau YouTube channel. They're pretty well known for making Bitcoin understandable, especially if you're maybe newer to it or just want that stronger foundation. Couldn't agree more. So our mission today, by the time we're done here, terms like uh, blockchain, mining, private keys, mm -hmm. they shouldn't sound like scary jargon anymore. Yeah, hopefully just concepts you get. Right. We want to give you that edge, that real understanding of what's going on with this whole phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, so let's dive in. Bitcoin wants to be this new kind of money. Where does Coin Bureau start that story? They start really simply, actually, with something super relatable. Imagine you owe a friend, say, $10. Okay, easy enough. The absolute simplest way. Cash, you hand it over. Done. Right, instant, peer-to-peer, -peer, just you and your friend. No yeah. bank involved. Pretty private, too. Totally private. But, and this is the catch, Coin Bureau points out there's a big limitation. You got to be there, right? In the same place. Exactly. You need physical presence. Trying to send cash far away, that gets complicated fast. Lots of trust involved, potential issues. Yeah, mailing cash isn't exactly ideal, so contrast that with how we usually send money electronically now. Okay, yeah. Think bank transfers, uh, PayPal, Venmo, credit cards, debit cards, all the usual suspects. And the common thread there, what ties them all together? There's always a middleman. Always. A bank, a payment processor, some third party sits in the middle handling the transaction. Which means you have to trust them. You absolutely have to trust them to do it right. And often there are fees involved, sometimes delays, especially if you're sending money internationally. Oh, yeah. Anyone who's done an international transfer knows that pain. Yeah. It can be slow and costly. So Bitcoin steps in here aiming to fix this. That's the core idea. Bitcoin is designed as a form of, well, digital cash. It lets you send value directly peer-to-peer -peer just over the internet. Hey. The goal is to cut out that need for trusting a middleman so you can do quick, direct transactions with someone, you know, halfway across the world if needed. So digital cash, peer-to-peer, -peer, that's central. But um, there's a key distinction we need to make, isn't there, when we say Bitcoin? Uh, yes, <laughs> crucial point. We need to separate Bitcoin with a big B from Bitcoin with a small B. Okay, explain that. Bitcoin, capital B, that's the whole system. The network, the software, the rules, the technology itself. The infrastructure. Exactly. Then Bitcoin, lowercase b, or BTC, that's the currency, the actual unit of value that gets sent around on the Bitcoin network. Got it. Like the internet versus email. Internet's the network, email uses it. Perfect analogy. Bitcoin is the network, Bitcoin BTC is the value moving on it. Okay. Now, who cooked this all up? This uh, revolutionary idea, we have to talk about Satoshi Nakamoto. The mystery man or woman or group. Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym, we still don't know who they really are. Crazy, isn't it? It really is. But their creation, wow, October 31st, 2008, Halloween, Satoshi drops the Bitcoin white paper. Right. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. The title says it all, really, and Coin Bureau pointed out that first sentence is key. Oh, hugely significant. It just lays it all out. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Boom. No banks. Direct payments online. That's the vision. That one sentence just set the stage for, well... Everything that followed. A whole new way of thinking about money online. Okay, but that brings up the big challenge, right? Yeah. How do you do that? How do you send money online directly without a bank in the middle making sure nobody cheats? Exactly. That's the million dollar question, maybe the billion dollar question now. Without a central authority checking the books, how do you stop someone spending the same digital coin 
twice. The double spending problem, I've heard that term. That's the one. It plagued earlier attempts at digital cash. Right. And also, how do you even know someone has the digital money they claim to have? You yeah. can't just rely on everyone being honest, especially online with strangers. Yeah, Coin Bureau made that point too. Trusting everyone online, not going to work long term. So how do traditional systems stop dishonesty? Well, with physical cash, making good fakes is hard and illegal, risky. Electronically, the banks keep meticulous records, every account balance, every transaction. When you pay, they check your balance, debit you, credit the other person. They prevent overdrafts, essentially. So it all comes back to trusting the bank, the central authority, to keep accurate records and enforce the rules. Exactly. And as Coin Bureau also notes, there's another layer of trust there, trusting the central banks not to, say, devalue the currency by printing too much money. Hmm. Good point. Hmm. So Satoshi needed a way around needing any central trusted party. Precisely. Satoshi's genius was solving this trust problem without a central authority. And the solution was this idea of a distributed ledger system. Distributed ledger. Okay, break that down. What does distributed mean here? It means instead of one central database like a bank has, the record of all transactions is shared across many, many computers running the Bitcoin software. These computers are called nodes. So not one ledger in one vault but copies of the ledger everywhere. Basically, yes. Every node keeps a full, identical, up-to-date copy of all the Bitcoin transactions and balances. Think of it like thousands of independent bookkeepers all watching each other. Okay, thousands of bookkeepers. How do they agree on what the record should be? They're constantly talking to each other, updating their ledgers, verifying new transactions, and reaching a consensus on the state of the network in near real time. It's a collective effort. Which sounds much harder to hack or tamper with than one central database. That's a key benefit Coin Bureau highlighted. A central database is a single point of failure, a target. A distributed ledger is much more resilient. Okay, so we have this shared verified record of transactions spread across many nodes. How do these transactions get like locked in permanently and in order. That's the blockchain part, right? Exactly. Transactions that have been verified by the network get bundled together. Roughly every 10 minutes, a new bundle called a block is created. A block of transactions. Right. And then this new block is cryptographically linked to the previous block, forming a chain. Block after block after block linked chronologically. That's your blockchain. Cryptographically linked. That sounds important for security. Coin Bureau mentioned hashing. Yes, hashing is critical. Each block gets a unique digital fingerprint, a hash, based on the data inside it and the hash of the block before it. Ah, so it includes the previous block's fingerprint. Precisely. So if you try to change anything in an old block, like sneakily give yourself more Bitcoin, the hash of that block changes completely. And because the next block included the original hash. The link breaks. The hash in the next block no longer matches the altered block's new hash. And since every subsequent block depends on the hash of the one before it, that change would ripple down and invalidate the entire chain from that point forward. Wow. Okay. So the network would instantly see that break in the chain. Instantly. Everyone running a node would see the inconsistency, that the hashes don't line up, and they'd reject the altered version of the chain. This makes the blockchain incredibly difficult, practically impossible to tamper with. It's immutable. Immutable. So no central authority needed for trust, and the record itself is tamper-proof because of this cryptographic chaining. That's, mm. that's pretty revolutionary. It really is. It solves the double spending problem without needing a bank. Now, who are these nodes? You said computers running the software. Is it hard to run one? What's the incentive? Good questions. Running a standard Bitcoin node, a validating node, is actually not that demanding, technically. Coin Bureau mentioned this. You need decent internet and enough disk space to store the whole transaction history, which is uh, pretty big now, but manageable for a standard computer. And why do it? Is there like a payment? Not directly, no. Not right. for just running a basic node that validates transactions and relays them. The main reward is ideological, you could say. You're contributing to the network security, its decentralization. The more nodes, the stronger Bitcoin is. Okay, voluntary support for the network. But then mining. We hear so much about Bitcoin mining. That sounds like it does have a financial incentive. It absolutely does. Miners are a special kind of node. They do everything a normal node does, but they also perform an extra, very energy intensive task. And they get paid for this. Yes. See, Bitcoin has a fixed supply. Only 21 million Bitcoin will ever exist. The way new Bitcoin enters circulation is as a reward to miners. How does that work? 
Every time a new block of transactions needs to be added to the blockchain, miners compete to be the one to add it. Compete, how? They have to solve a very difficult computational puzzle. Coin Bureau simplified it as kind of like guessing a massive random number, but basically it requires immense processing power. So it's a race. A constant race. The first miner to find the solution to the puzzle gets the right to add the next block to the chain. And for doing so, they receive a reward. Brand new Bitcoin, freshly created, plus all the transaction fees people paid for the transactions included in that block. Ah, okay, so that's the block reward. And that's how new Bitcoin gets made until the 21 million limit is reached. Exactly. And that computationally hard puzzle they solve, that's the proof of work. Proof of work, got it. It proves they spent computational effort, energy to validate the block and secure the network. Right. And because it's so expensive and energy intensive to do this work, it makes it economically irrational for someone to try and cheat the system by creating fraudulent blocks. The cost would outweigh any potential gain. And that energy use. Yeah. That's the controversial part, right? Mm -hmm. Coin Bureau touched on that. Yeah. Bitcoin mining uses a lot of electricity, no doubt. There's a whole ongoing discussion about that, including the shift towards using more renewable energy sources, as Coin Bureau mentioned. But, you know, that's maybe a deep dive for another day. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But the key point is this proof of work mining is how the network stays secure and how new coins are issued. Okay, so nodes, miners, blockchain, mm -hmm. sounds super technical. Yeah. Do I need to understand all this nitty gritty just to like use Bitcoin? Oh, definitely not. That's a really important point Coin Bureau made. For the average user, no. Anyone with internet can send or receive BTC. You don't need special hardware or software. You don't need to be a miner or run a node. Phew, okay. Good to know. Think of it like using email. You don't need to understand SMTP protocols to send a message. You just use an app. Same idea with Bitcoin for most people. Okay, so if I'm just a user, what do I need to understand about keeping my Bitcoin safe? That brings us to keys, right? Public key cryptography. Yes, exactly. This is fundamental to user security in Bitcoin. There are three main parts you need to know about. Your private key, your public key, and your Bitcoin address. All right, let's break those down. Private key, what is it? The private key is basically a super long, randomly generated secret code. Think of it, as Coin Bureau put it, like the master password to your Bitcoin vault. Secret is the key word there. Absolutely crucial. You must keep your private key secret. Anyone who gets it can control, can spend the Bitcoin associated with it. It gives complete authority. Okay, guard the private key with my life. Got it. Mm. What about the public key? The public key is generated from your private key using some complex math. But importantly, it's a one-way street. You can get the public key from the private key, but you can't go backwards. You can't figure out the private key just by knowing the public key. Okay, so the public key isn't secret. Nope, it can be shared. Think of it like your bank account number. You need to give it out for people to send you money, or in this case, Bitcoin. It allows you to receive sons. Makes sense. Private key for spending, public key for receiving. What about the Bitcoin address then? Sounds similar to the public key. It is related. The Bitcoin address is derived from your public key, again, through some math. It's oh. usually shorter and includes some features like error checking. It's the actual string of letters and numbers, or sometimes a QR code that you actually share with someone when you want them to send Bitcoin to you. So the address is like the specific send to instruction based on the public key. Exactly. And you can actually generate many addresses from a single public key, which helps with privacy. Okay. Private key. Secret for spending. Public key. Shareable for receiving. Address what you actually share. How do I manage all this? That's where wallets come in. Precisely. A Bitcoin wallet, which is usually software or sometimes hardware, does two main things. It securely stores your private keys and it manages your addresses so you can easily send and receive Bitcoin. Does the wallet actually hold the Bitcoin itself? Ah, uh, common misconception, no. The wallet doesn't hold the coins. Your Bitcoin exists as records on the blockchain, the distributed ledger. The wallet holds the private keys that give you the power to access and control your Bitcoin on that ledger. Okay, the keys, not the coins. Important yeah. distinction. Now, for someone just starting out today, how do they usually a Bitcoin and a wallet? The most common route, as Coinbeer mentioned, is through a cryptocurrency exchange. Think Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, places like that. Right, and when you sign up, they give you a wallet. Usually, yes. They provide what's called a hosted wallet or an exchange wallet. It's super convenient for getting started. I sense a butt coming. <laughs> hosted wallet. What's the catch? <laughs> the catch is significant. With a hosted wallet on an exchange, the exchange holds your private keys for you. Ah, uh, 
so I don't actually have the secret key. You don't. You're trusting the exchange to keep it safe, to manage your Bitcoin properly, and, well, to stay in business and operate honestly. And that trust mm. hasn't always been rewarded, has it? Coin Bureau mentioned hacks, FTX. Exactly. Exchange hacks happen. Exchanges can go bankrupt, like FTX did spectacularly. If the exchange controls your keys and something goes wrong with the exchange, you could potentially lose access to your Bitcoin. It introduces that element of third-party trust and risk back into the equation. Which kind of defeats the original purpose of Bitcoin, right? The peer-to-peer, -peer, yeah. do trust needed idea. Precisely. This is why the concept of self-custody is so incredibly important in the Bitcoin world. Self-custody, meaning well, holding your own keys. Yes. Taking responsibility for storing and managing your own private keys. This way, you and only you have ultimate control over your Bitcoin. Remember, the wallet holds the keys. The keys control the Bitcoin on the blockchain. Okay, so if I want to do that, take control myself, what are my options? How do I practice self-custody? Coin Bureau laid out the two main ways. First, software wallets. These are apps you install on your computer or smartphone. They generate and store your private keys directly on your device. Okay, keys on my phone or a laptop. Right. The second option, generally seen as much more secure, especially for larger amounts, is a hardware wallet. Hardware wallet, like a physical thing. Exactly. It's a small, dedicated physical device, often looks like a USB stick. It's designed specifically to keep your private keys stored offline, totally isolated from your internet-connected computer or phone. Offline storage. Uh, so much harder for hackers to get at. Massively harder. It protects against malware, phishing, all sorts of online threats. Coin Bureau strongly recommended looking into hardware wallets if you're serious about securing your Bitcoin long term. There are other resources, too, for more detail on how they work. Right. So it seems the big takeaway, echoing Coin Bureau, is starting on an exchange is fine, maybe even easy. But the crucial next step, if you really want to embrace the Bitcoin ethos and secure your assets, is moving to self-custody, taking control of those private keys. Absolutely. That's the core principle. Bitcoin was built to be trustless. Relying on a third party, however secure they seem, kind of goes against the grain. Not your keys, not your coins is a very common saying for a reason. Well, this has been incredibly helpful, really breaking down those fundamentals. Bitcoin's deep for sure. There's always more to learn. But hopefully this gives you, our listener, a much stronger grasp of what it is and uh, how it all fits together. Yeah, hopefully it demystifies some of it. And like Coin Bureau suggests, if this sparks your interest, there's tons more information out there to dig into the real nitty gritty. Definitely. So as we wrap up, maybe a final thought to leave you with. Right. We live in such a digital world now, right? We're so reliant on electronic payments. What does it really mean long term for society, for you as an individual to have this option? A truly peer-to-peer -peer, trustless way to hold and send value. Something to think about. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.